one. Rejection shows up all the time. And if you are someone that wants something, let's say you want to recognize things about yourself that need up-leveling, you want to be in a committed relationship, you want all those things, you need to be prepared to be rejected. Mm. And in the same token, you will continue to be rejected until the right thing comes along for you. Hey everybody, I'm Dougal Fraser. Welcome back to my channel. If you are enjoying these episodes, do me a favor, click like and subscribe because it helps me a bunch. Today, we are gonna be exploring shadow work. Now, if you're not familiar with shadow work, think of it in this sort of simple form. Shadow work is the part of our personality that makes actions and decisions based on fear or insecurity. Everybody out there has a shadow side, every single person, so it's nothing to be insecure about. But my guest today had a very unique experience observing her own shadow side that not a lot of us get the opportunity to have, but it ended up being a pretty powerful catalyst for change. So we're going to dive in today with life coach, recent new dog mother, and other <laughs> exciting things that we're going to talk about, Caitlin Herman. Caitlin, thank you for Hi. being here. Oh my God, I'm so happy to have dog mom as a part of my bio. I Honestly. know. You literally just adopted a dog, what, a few days we ago? Did. Yeah, a few days ago on President's Day. I don't know if that's um, something to celebrate. Somehow necessarily. symbolic. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm loving mom life. Really Congratulations. Am. The dog's Thank name you. is Sneakers, which is adorable. Thank you so much. I super, like that. super I've, cute. I've had the name picked out for many years. Many oh, years. I love that. Very sweet. Yeah. So I want to jump in because you do have sort of an interesting experience. You are a life coach. You are a wonderful spiritual teacher. I really admire all the stuff that you do on social media Thank and you. getting to know you. But you also were a reality show contestant, which is kind sure. of interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about that unique yeah. journey? Yeah. Of course. So, hi, sneakers. Hi, so, sneakers. essentially, um, you know, I had a regular job. I was in the music industry when I was straight out of college. And, um, you know, I, I had a bad experience with the industry I was in. And I began to question some things in my life and had some sort of spiritual awakening and realized that I wanted to start going and researching a way to become a certified life coach and what that would entail. And throughout my process of doing that, I just realized being in New York was not for me. So I decided to go to LA. That's mm. where I felt it was more aligned with being a coach. So I did that. And when I was there, I somehow ended up in a situation where I was applying for Big Brother and I got on the show. And that was a very interesting thing to do because here I am thinking, oh, I've done all this work on myself throughout my right. coaching certification program. I'm going to go on this show and I'm going to show people that like being so woo woo and, you know, self-reflective is a good thing. Little did I know I was such a fucking mock. Am I allowed to curse? You can do whatever you want. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I was such a mockery because... I was probably one of the most unwoke, un, um, like I just didn't, I lost myself in there so much. So yeah. what I thought would be my strength based on my career path was actually not a strength at all, but it was super helpful for when I got off the show, which was probably the most important part when I needed it. So here's the thing though. So set up Big Brother for me, because admittedly, sure. I only watched the first season like years and years and years ago. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. is it correct that you are basically isolated from the entire world? You cannot talk to your friends, you cannot talk to your family, no right. news, no nothing. So you're in this sort of incubator of energy right. and attention that you aren't aware of how the world is receiving you, right? Correct. So it's you and 15 other house guests and you are locked in a house which is created on the big brother cbs lot in um in studio city and aside from the fact that we have a backyard and we can go outside um a few days a week and then that backyard also gets converted into where we have our competitions held it is completely sequestered we don't see anyone else except for each other when we go into the diary room to do like our confessionals we are talking to a camera we hear the voice of one of the story producers but we don't see them mm. and that's it we have absolutely no influence sometimes we'll try to mess around with the story producers and be like so uh what's going on, on the outside like so <laughs> is this a bad like if they trying ask to get question, information oh yeah they'll be yeah. like so you're hoh like 
head of household, who do you plan on putting up this week? And then he'll ask a question. So you're putting up so-and-so. Do you think that's a good idea? And I'll be like, I don't know. Do you think it's a good idea? Like you try very hard to get stuff out of them, but they will not. You don't know anything. You know nothing. So as a spiritual person, as a self-aware person, you go in with this sense of confidence. Like I know myself. I know who I am. Are you immediately triggered with vulnerability or do you not even know what's going on until you leave? I, here's the thing. When I went, it's so symbolic. It's like you open that front door to go into the house and then you're in a different world essentially. Mm -hmm. And from the second I walked in, I was a different person in a lot of ways because there is a game aspect of it. I want to watch the show. Yeah. So you kind of lose your identity, try to bring on another identity it's very strange. I, I can't explain it. In but an effort to win. In an effort to win. I mean, the prize is $500,000. So right. this is not an atmosphere and an environment for me to be a spiritual person. <laughs> I thought, though, that I could. I right. really thought I could. Mm. That being said, if I ever get the opportunity to go back and play again, mm. I know I could. But mm. if it's your first time going in there and you are- And how old were you? I, I was 24. So so let's just pause with that for a second. 24 yeah. years old. Our early yeah. 20s are where we're still trying to figure out who we are. We're somewhere between adult and child. Our, sure. our personality is still forming. Then you're thrown into a space with a bunch of strangers with the entire country watching you. Yes. How would that not shake anyone's sense of self-care and self-love? Well, that's the thing. I thought it wouldn't. I really, ju- I mean, I- You felt I, that strong in yourself. I felt that strong in myself. And that's a big difference of who I was then versus who I am now, which I don't know if you experienced this, but like when I was first kind of developing my sense of self and was getting super into spirituality and X, Y, and Z, I was kind of a know-it-all in mm. a sense. Like <laughs> yeah. I was kind of in the sense, I was like, no, like around me to be like, no, if you read this, if you do this, like I probably, like, cause I'm so, I was so enthusiastic about it. Yeah. Where the difference between then and now is that like one, I don't, I don't know at all. And two, I don't want to know it all, mm. but I was, re- yeah, I was really, if I can bring myself back to that place, I was so sure of mm. myself and that I would win and all this stuff when I mean, I lost myself on every level That's in that house. Every level. You took me away from my boyfriend of four and a half years. Mm. You took me away from my family, all these people, all the validation I was getting on a constant daily basis from friends and family. You take me away from them and you lock me in this house. And I was, who's going to give it to me? Who's going to give it to me? Who's going to give it to me? Mm. To the point where I actually thought, and who knows if I did or didn't, it's, it's something that I'll grapple with for the rest of my life, but... To the point where I really thought that I fell out of love with my boyfriend, in love with someone else, when in reality, I didn't fall out of love with my boyfriend. I didn't fall in love with someone else. I just needed the attention. Wow. Um, And I didn't love myself enough. Because if I really loved myself enough, I wouldn't have steered emotion. I didn't physically cheat, but worse, I emotionally started an attachment with someone else on that show. And I genuinely... There's two things. One, not once did it cross my mind of like, I wonder what he's going to think and his mm. family and my family and all that. Not really? Once. So, not so, once. no, wait, wait, so, wait. so you're, you're on TV. I recognize that you worked in the music industry. So maybe you didn't have media savvy connected to what it meant to be talent or to be on camera. But did you forget? Because I've done some reality before. I was on The Real House of Orange County. What? And um, a day of filming, I did forget. Like, even though there's lights and there's cameras, like, you do get to a moment where you do start to forget for a second. Did you forget? I'll tell you what happens. I never forgot. Never forgot. Because I'm still playing a game. So I know that there's right, still a mission. Right, I forget the game element. And yeah, exactly. So, yeah. like, I never forgot, but I'll tell you what happened. I knew there would be moments where, like, maybe I was being, like, I was emotionally, and again, when I say emotionally cheating, it was because emotionally I went somewhere else, but there was a side to me in that moment where I was, like, I am emotional, I emotionally connect with everyone, Mm. so who is, you know, my boyfriend or family or the fans to say that, like, I've emotion, I'm emotionally romantically invested in X, Y, and Z, which, like, Mm. I was, like, you can fucking tell I was, Um, (laughs) but the part is, I never forgot the cameras were on, I genuinely thought to myself 
in some moments, like the repercussions of my actions are not immediate. I'm not getting mm. a text or a call from my boyfriend saying what's going on. For mm. all I know, I'm going to be in this house for another 99 days. So I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Mm. It, it's a very strange, like, I'm living in the present. I'm going to be here for so long. I'm, I'll somehow... I'll somehow be able to fix it. Like, mm. because it's not immediate. It's like, you know, if like my dog, for whatever reason, like blows up my house and shits all over the place or whatever, I, there's You're an gonna immediate reaction. I'm yeah, going to yeah, see yeah. it. Yeah. But in the back of my mind, there wasn't this sense of urgency to like not follow my instincts on, on those moments. Cause I was like, I'll, I'll, yeah. And also there were moments where I was like, surely everyone will understand. Like, right. surely everyone understands in hard what it's is. like yeah. to be away from everyone and this and that. But the fact is nobody understands. And I remember one thing my, my ex had said to me when I got off, he was like, Caitlin, if the roles were reversed and I was playing the game, I would have never done that to you. Hmm, and as much as I hard. understand his sentiment, yeah, I do not believe it because I'm not the first and I haven't been the last to get into a situation like I did sure. part of this experiment. And, and I'm sure you can relate to this human connection is so vital. Like, yeah, and you, you bring up a good point of like, you're a naturally emotional person. And I think a lot of spiritual people, I think a lot of people drawn to self-help are naturally emotional. So whether we're at a yes. cocktail party or someone's, you know, bagging our groceries, we tend to connect to them and say, what are you doing? Do you have a family? Yes. And so if everyone's taken away, it would make sense to me that your heart would then look to replace those links. But it's yes. curious that it was outside of self versus inside of self. Correct. And then the step further is, and by the way, when I, the second I opened that door and I got mm. sent home and I saw the audience, which there's a live studio audience was the second I was like, fuck. This is what I want to know. So, because be it becomes an avalanche of opinion. And so it's funny, I knew we were doing this interview last week and I was away and I turned the TV on in the hotel and it turned on to Celebrity. the current season of yeah. Big Brother. Yeah. And so, it, and I hope I'm saying his name right, but Todrick Hall, I only watched one episode and then the next day I was on Twitter and I was like, oh, it appears to me that people are very frustrated with him and he has no idea. So Correct. he is going to come out into the world with his version in his mind of what happened and is going to be hit with an avalanche of everybody's opinion of their version of what happened. Correct. And last night was the finale and he came in second place and you kind of watched his face mm. as the votes were being read and he's mm. realizing that- Not going the way he thought. Like him. It's, it's very, I'll tell you exactly what happens if you want some intake as to you get off the show, now what? How are you told all of this stuff? Yeah. Okay? And are so, you given tools to like, are you given a coach? Or, I mean, not to, we don't want to. Talk, let's, talk about, <laughs> let's talk about the tools that we're given. Okay. So what happens is you see the live studio audience. There's not a live studio audience now over the last like three years because of COVID. Mm. But when, when it's a regular season, you come out, you're evicted by a vote of blah, blah, blah. Caitlin, you're evicted from the big brother house. You open the door. There's a live studio audience. You haven't seen people in forever. You sit down with Julie Chen as she asks you a bunch of questions about your game. And I'm like, uh, I don't even know what's going on, whatever. And then you get taken to like, a, you know, a makeup room basically. Mm. Where the first person that comes in is the casting director who is Robin Cast my ear. She sits down, she says, you know, I'm so proud of you. You played hard, you played great, blah, 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 great. Next person that comes in is Dr. Zachary. She is the show's psychologist. Mm. Very brief, like, how are you doing? And in that moment with Dr. <laughs> Zachary. Was there a tone? <laughs> there was a tone. There was like a, hey, um, if you need me, I'll be here. And I'm just mm. like, why would I need you? Although in that moment, I was like, even the, the second I walked out, I knew that I could just tell. Mm. So I was like, thanks, Dr. Zachary. Bye. And then the seven executive producers of the show come in. And they kind of do a recap with you. But they don't say it. They just talk about their, your game, whatever. The next morning, you, you stay at a hotel that night. You still don't get your phone. The next morning, you do press. So again, I can't have my phone for that because they don't want my, my answers for the press to be influenced by what I actually now know to be true from social media, or there's parts of the game. I don't know. There are alliances that I didn't know about. They want to wait till after, after all of the press is done, you get 
put up with this woman, Sean, who's one of the greatest women on earth. She's one of the executive producers. And this is the time where we get a debrief of, Mm. hey, here's a, before we give you your phone back, before we send you home, there's a few things that you need to be made aware of. That's really intense. Really intense. For some people, it's not intense. For some people, you know, they aren't as emotional or they aren't as like, chatty they don't share as much they're not as vibrant so it's Mm. like okay like get your phone back you'll notice there was a lot of comment this and that for me it was a different story for me Mm. it was like we haven't spoken to my ex um he pulled his release so uh anytime you spoke about him on the live feeds which by the way live feeds 24 7 they can see what i'm doing seeing whatever Mm. um so we haven't spoken to him in a while and you should know you said this thing and that thing and you have a lot of supporters. You also have a lot of people that don't like you. You have to remember that you were saying a lot of things and meditating and doing a lot of stuff where the majority of the, the viewers of the show are like middle America. Mm. And like a lot, and I was the first cast, like, you know, niche demographic of like the spiritual girl mm. on Big Brother ever. There's mm. never been someone that was like a new person. Usually they bring on like the athlete and the surfer and this and right, that. Right, I was right. the first one. So a lot of archetypes. people, exactly the archetypes. A lot of people were not uh, loving it. Yeah. And this was in 2018. And there was not, I've noticed obviously since COVID, there's been this like emergence of people yeah. really getting into it, which I love. But yeah, it was, it was a lot of feedback, a lot of, a lot of, I'm sure you'll love this, a lot of, you're 24, how the fuck are you a life coach? Like, how are you right. giving advice? Well, honey, I'm not giving advice. Like, that's, right. you don't know what a life coach is. It's not coach life coaching, so, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And if, and by the way, if you do have a life coach that's giving you advice, I, I highly encourage you to go somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was a lot of that, a lot of that. But um, when I first got out, the first six months, I knew I needed to, have my own therapist, my own life coach, and mm. I needed to not coach. Did you go into a depression? I didn't go into a depression. I went into like a really intense state of gratitude. Really? Like, That's interesting. Y- because yeah. I, do th- I do think within the digital age, everybody's experiencing this on some degree, right? You can make a post at night and turn your phone off and wake up in the morning. And perhaps there's a flurry of reactions that you yeah. weren't expecting. You talk about your spiritual belief system. Maybe you come out of the closet and talk about wanting to start like a spiritual career. So everybody on some degree has more eyes on them than we ever have before. Right. Now, <laughs> this is a pressure cooker kind of a situation. Right. And so tell me how going through that kind of scrutiny leads one to gratitude, because that's an interesting perspective. I I say for a lot of reasons that I'm still, you would think watching me on the show that I had absolutely no background in self-help, wasn't interested, didn't care. But it came so powerfully to me. Like, I, I thank God every day for the fact that I had that foundation coming off the show because just because I had a experience that I didn't expect on the show does not change my fundamental beliefs that everything's happening for the highest good at any given moment. And that does not not include this moment. And I knew that in that moment, there was a powerful lesson being given to me and that there was room for growth and Mm. who am I? And I got to be honest, this is going to sound, I mean, this is going to sound, and I hated saying this at the time, but it's the truth. It's literally the truth. I had a really wonderful upbringing, not to say I don't have shit today that was, you know, from my childhood, whatever. But when I talked about struggle or like, you know, when I was first getting into my coaching and I went through my program, there was a lot of work that was done on like, your childhood and struggles that you've been through in your life. And I always felt very guilty at the fact that aside from small relationships and like dynamics that were tough, I didn't have any like struggle. There was a foundation of love. There was a, there was, and and not to say constantly all the time, but for the most part, like there was not this big or several big things that had happened to me in my life. And I always felt like, kind of weird about it like Mm. I I was grateful for it but it also made me feel just like in a way I didn't know what I was talking about and Mm. this weird thing happened to me where even when I was coming off and I had moments of 
reading DMs that were terrible and watching my own behavior back that was really difficult to watch. Yeah. I had this, I had this moment of like, oh no, these are the things, Kate. Yeah. Like these are the things that you didn't know were struggles or that come from different parts. So it it's just the shadow. All, <laughs> it all became so prominent to me. And I gotta tell you, there was no other way that this could have been done. Like the universe needed to put me or somehow I end up on a reality show where it's like the most, you can't avoid this now, yeah, yeah, Caitlin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. we are all holding you accountable for this because you would have never seen it in the event of X, Y, and Z. So like, and I, I was aware of it. So I knew that the work needed to be done, hired a coach, hired, you know, a therapist, stopped coaching because needed to work on myself. And that's where like really this whole healing journey began of like, yo, you need a lot of validation, sis. Like you really do. And it's interesting to me because I do see this trend of healers or intuitives or therapists that typically have gone through some sort of intense traumatic experience. And forgive me, big brother, but that's a pretty traumatic experience in my opinion. So do you think this like took your empathy to the next level and talk about your coaching practice now? How has it evolved? How do you see yourself as a teacher? Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but when I got off the show and then I started doing my own healing and whatnot, when I decided that I was comfortable coaching again, um, I had like a moment where I was like, okay, let's take the obvious facts here. The obvious facts are that you're an ICF certified life coach. Great. The facts are that you were also just had a traumatic experience on a reality show. What are you going to do with both of those things? Yeah. Um, be a coach for people that had traumatic experiences on reality shows. Like, is that it really was like, what you specialize in? Yeah. So wow. that was the most, yeah, I don't think you knew that. So I still have other clients. Like mm. I still, I still take other clients, but I am kind of like the, there have been, and I am not trying to shade at all, but I've seen some. You can if you want. <laughs> yeah, but it's going to be judgment. It's going to be kind of judgment. <laughs> Well, I guess it's a safe space, but like, I know of one person who is like, I think America's life coach, that's what he like calls himself. And I know mm -hmm. he's started to hang around a lot of the reality TV bachelor, bachelorette, like all of this stuff. And, um, he's taken some of those clients that I've had, which is totally fine because I honestly think like there should be more people that are helping reality people. Yeah. But I also began to realize that. I don't want to identify. There was a time where that really served me to like correlate the two, but I'm finding now that I don't need to do that and I don't want to do that and I want to separate it. So I'm like happy to have someone else kind of like sure. doing that work, but I still have a few reality clients, but yeah, it just began, I began to see that like there was not enough emotional support, although you have the psychologist, this, that, and the next there wasn't an actual person that was there guiding you of like, Hey, now you have a following. Yeah. What do you want? How does this sit well with like who you are? What are your values? And how does being an influencer aid to, to support that? Like there were so many things that, that needed to, you know, be addressed. And that's what I started to really do after mm. the fact. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me because, you know, I always feel ridiculous saying this, but we do live in a really bizarre time at the moment. We do. Like it just feels like there's constant curveball after curveball, yeah. which is making everybody re-examine everything from their career to where they want to live to I've I've seen so many relationship transformations in the past two years. Oh my god. And I just think we're in this place where people are taking their decision making a little bit more seriously of what's the most important to them as a life coach, as a spiritual peace person. How do you think people can lean into this opportunity of transformation? This sort of opera. You had this moment of like, wow, I get to see myself on TV. We now have the world sort of boiling, so to speak. And everybody's pausing and saying, what kind of life do I actually want to live? Yeah. I'd say like, as far as action steps are concerned, like the first step, you know, like in any 12 step programs, like acknowledge you have a problem. Great. I like with step one to also be like, be really super curious mm. about your actions and like the way you respond to things. If you notice yourself getting tense about 
if something happens for someone else and it's affecting you somehow, or if you're getting left out of plans from friends, or if the, if you walk away feeling any, the way you feel, just be so curious about it to the point where it's like, be, becomes reflective and then you could acknowledge oh wow like my curiosity is now making me realize that like maybe this part of me is super unhealed so like the most basic step I can give someone because like a lot of people think like what's the big thing that I can do tomorrow it's such a process that like just begin to get curious about the way you respond to things and then that will lead to some sort of transformation you're not going to stay the same if you begin to identify certain things about yourself that deserve being like deserve curiosity honestly mm. and would it be would it be fair to say that you experienced i hesitate to use this word but i have to go with it a sure. sort of level of public rejection oh and, my god yeah okay. <laughs> and so i say this to every human being whether you're an artist and you're putting up you know your poetry for the first time yeah. or you're sharing a picture from the wedding location that you selected or the couch that you selected in your living room everybody is going to experience rejection on some level yeah and i think a lot of people sort of freeze because they don't want to experience rejection as someone who has experienced an avalanche of rejection, what are words of wisdom of how can one fuel that into gratitude in the way in which you did? Well, it's funny you say that because I was just texting a friend before that was asking me about like the rejection as far as dating is concerned. Yeah, right? that's a and big like one. rejection shows up all the time. And if you are someone that wants something, let's say you want to recognize things about yourself that need up leveling. You want to be in a committed relationship. You want all those things. You need to be prepared to be rejected. Mm. And in the same token, you will continue to be rejected until the right thing comes along for you. And like, like reframing and re-understanding what rejection means. It's like society has placed this idea behind rejection that it's like a negative words that like yeah. being rejected is a negative thing when like I take it as an experience like it's neither good nor bad like it is just what's happening here and I know it's like corny but I love like the quote like something's like whatever rejection is God's protection or the universe's protection or whatever you want to believe in but I I do believe that to be true because if it's for you it's gonna be like right. it's just gonna be so if something is rejecting itself and even if it's like I hate to sound gross it's just like this just came to me but like you don't even get like fucking food poisoning right and like you're gonna throw up and shit your pants like whatever is not for you is going to reject itself out of your body in some sort of capacity so feeling like public rejection or rejection even on a small scale if you were not on a show and it was like a small group of friends and you're feeling left out there is I believe very firmly that there is some sort of protection over you in those moments of rejection and if you feel uncomfortable being rejected or sad or debilitated this is your opportunity now to ask yourself why do I feel this way why mm. do I feel so much worth from this person or this thing rejecting me and then it needs to come back to yourself if you really loved yourself as much as I hope we all can and we all should and we all have mm. the ability to you don't actually need that outside stuff. Mm. It's nice to have it. We all like, like it. Of course. But you, don't, sugar. But you don't need it. Yeah. You don't need it. Yeah. It's, you know, I always talk to people because uh, I, you could wallpaper my house from rejection letters from my first book. And That's at first amazing. it really struck my ego where I was like, oh, they don't get me and they don't understand. Like, you know, and I'm talking to people, seasoned professionals in the world of publishing. And at some point, yeah, I, just, yeah. <laughs> at some point I had to sit down and be like, hmm, maybe I could write differently. Maybe right. I could listen to these notes and, and behave differently or with relationships. You know, when I was younger, I would think, why, 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 why? Well, I don't want to be in a relationship with someone that isn't vibing with me. That would be a miserable totally. life. So now I feel more satisfied that I found someone that we were both at the same energy at the same time. Yes. So you're just very poignantly sort of pointing out how rejection can sort of fuel us to become our most authentic self. hundred percent. I think that's super, super cool. Okay. No, so, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> How can people get a hold of you if they want to know more about your coaching? Tell us all of the social media ways. Yeah, for sure. So um, 
you can go on my website, katecoaching.com, and that's where you can find any sort of like application that you'd want to submit if you were interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching. Um, I host a program called Spiritually Single. I do it once every three months. It's a five-week course, and I take about 10 to 15 girls. Um, this is only for women. Sorry, boys, maybe one day, but right now this is just for women. And it's kind of your guide to falling in love with yourself, therefore falling in love with a partner, the whole thing. Um, so just stay, you can go to the website, stay tuned for those announcements. You can listen to my podcast, Kate Coaching the Podcast. Find me on Instagram at Caitlin underscore Herman. I think that's it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I love that program. That sounds amazing. First of all, Thank I'm you. loving getting to know you. You're super know, fascinating <laughs> and it's been really fun. Congratulations on being a dog mom. And thank you so much for being with us. Of course. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. All right, guys, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to click like, and I'll put the link below with all the information for Caitlin. Do not forget shadow self-rejection. It's all part of our journey. And we've learned today that it can fuel us to be a better person. Have a great day. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye.